Uh, I'd like to call the APC meeting of April 19, 2022 to order. Uh, and the first item on the agenda to look at is the adoption of the, or the second item, the adoption of the agenda. Do I have a motion to do so? So moved. Doug, John, all in favor? Okay, the next item is the adoption of the minutes of April 5, 2022. I was not at that meeting, but uh, do I have a motion to adopt? So moved. Doug? John, Dan, <laughs> uh, any discussion? Uh, any comments, questions, observations on it? All's hunky dory. Uh, okay. Uh, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Dirge unanimously. The next item, which will take the rest of the day, is the uh, draft climate action plan, which was included in our agenda. And uh, a suggestion for how to proceed. I assume there'll be a presentation. And then after the presentation, uh, some questions. And my suggestion is that we do what we did with the OCP draft as well, that we kind of systematically go through parts. There are some parts from my perspective, at least, that I think we can glide through pretty quickly. And then there are other parts that are fairly meaty that we may want to look at. Uh, but I think uh, the method that we did with that was when members had a question or a comment that we spent the time to deal with that. So we'll see how it goes. OK, so a presentation. Who's making the presentation? OK. Hey. Version percent not. Mm, I think it's full screen on down there. Okay. Great. And Danny, Danny won't be able to see this, but you can follow along. Okay. Yes, we're sure. Uh, everything's along. Yep. Yeah. All righty. So my name is Kira, for those I haven't met before, and I'm the Climate Action Planner for the, or Coordinator for the Town of Sydney. And uh, over the next 10-ish minutes or so, I'll give a brief update on the development of the Climate Action Plan. Um, and then kind of where we're at with engagement as well, just for your information. So this slide just shows an overview of the process to date. A um, couple of key points are, you know, the two engagement phases. So we're in engagement phase two right now. Um, and has also gone through multiple levels of in-house review through staff uh, throughout the local government at different levels. Um, yeah, I can also send this presentation out afterwards if people would like to look back to it. So to give, start us off, we've got part one. It'll be kind of a brief overview and I'll leave most of it to part two to discuss. Um, but basically part one serves to help readers understand the purpose of the plan and the importance of addressing climate change as well as providing an overview of our existing conditions. Um, so, you know, what are our climate risks? Um, what are the GHG emissions for the town and for the community? Um, and then what are the goals we're working towards? So in the OCP, those were discussed as, um, are, they're currently proposed as 50% reductions by 2030 and um, carbon neutrality by 2050. Um, it's also important to acknowledge that, you know, these targets are really only achievable with major action at higher levels of government, both federal and provincial, um, like massive investment in transit service, but um, it's, the town still has an important role to play in kind of that larger effort. So I'll leave that there for now. Um, so then kind of the bulk of the presentation will be about each of the focus areas. Um, and there's eight of those and there's 46 actions in the plan as you folks have seen in the draft. Um, but yeah, each, each slide will be kind of a, a, a taste of what's in each part and then we'll talk more later about the, the nitty gritty. So, um, there we go. So the town leadership focus area highlights what we can do to reduce our emissions as an organization. Um, this is particularly important 
to address our vehicle emissions um, from our you know, town fleet and uh, our town owned buildings, since these are the two major sources of our emissions. Um, and this is also about embedding climate action throughout the organization and decision-making processes uh, at all levels of the government. Uh, the next focus area is infrastructure. Um, and this addresses how we as the town can work to make sure that our physical infrastructure is as resilient to climate risks as possible, um, like to extreme weather and sea level rise down the road. Um, this isn't necessarily saying we're gonna upsize all of our pipes, um, but rather that there's a need to evaluate the different options that are available to us uh, to address these risks through our asset management processes, because um, you know these are very expensive can be very expensive projects, and it's important to start planning and budgeting early for those. The next one is kind of the biggie, which is transportation and mobility, um, as this is the community's main source of emissions, um, which also means it's the biggest opportunity for us to see reductions. So two ways of looking at it. <laughs> um, the approach used in the plan was to look at the barriers identified um, by community members through public engagement um, and to see what needs to be done to address those barriers. Uh, some of the biggest barriers identified by people in the survey were um, insufficient bike parking and bike routes. Um, so the plan includes actions to address those both from a policy and regulatory perspective. Um, and through physical uh, projects we can implement, like installing bike racks um, in strategic locations. So both the policy side and the capital project side. Uh, land use is kind of um, connects to the OCP. So the idea behind land use here is to acknowledge the kind of physical layout of the community impacts people's decision-making. Um, there's highlights that there's value in locating people near businesses and services um, so that it's more convenient to walk or bike or take your wheelchair or, you know, any kind of um, mobility besides a car. Um, for example, the OCP is proposing neighborhood commercial policy areas um, so that people who live further away from downtown who wouldn't want to walk to downtown for a cup of coffee um, would have the opportunity to do that locally or pick up a snack or meet friends closer to home, um, outside their home. Especially, you know, during times of COVID where we're not as comfortable being as close inside. Uh, this is buildings focus area, which is another big one since it's the second biggest source of our emissions as a community. Um, with switching to electricity being uh, essential to meet emissions reductions established in the OCP. So switching homes in the community, retrofitting from natural gas and oil to electric. Um, buildings are also a key focus area because these kinds of initiatives often both reduce emissions and improve resilience to climate risks like heat and extreme weather, those kinds of things. Um, retrofitting buildings can kind of be two birds, one stone kind of actions. Um, for example, with heat pumps, they both reduce emissions and make the home less likely to overheat during heat waves through the air conditioning side of the work. Um, the biggest barrier identified by residents was cost, unsurprisingly, um, illustrating both the value in our kind of top-up rebates that we have. Thank you, Council. <laughs> um, but also in helping people navigate the many different rebates that are available right now. Um, both to the provincial and federal government, because there's a lot of confusion around that um, has been some of the feedback from folks, um, you know, including a new income qualified program for those who don't make a lot of money. Um, they can get you know, up to 95% of their retrofit covered by the government. So big bucks there. Uh, yeah. And then natural environment. Um, so this focus area acknowledges that our ecosystems are both impacted by climate change um, and can help reduce the impacts of climate change by supporting stormwater management and providing weather protection like shade um, in the warmer months. Um, it also highlights that hard infrastructure isn't the only way 
uh, the only option in tackling sea level rise. So we can also consider how green shores approaches can be um, where they might be appropriate in the community. Um, second last, uh, emergency preparedness is an element of adaptation. Uh, since this is where we have the opportunity to assess nearer term risks uh, and how we might respond to those like the heat wave last summer. So for example, there's the um, vulnerability risk assessment that the emergency management folks do every three to four years. So there's an opportunity there to integrate some climate risk uh, considerations. Um, this is also a really great opportunity, uh, emergency preparedness, uh, for public education uh, about risks like flooding and heat and how the community can be proactive in preparing for those individually, like having emergency kits and, you know, extra water and uh, heat relief, things close to home. Last but not least, food and waste. Um, waste is a smaller contributor to community emissions, as you would have seen in the plan, or we can talk about later as well. Um, but there's still opportunities for reductions by minimizing organics going to our landfill, uh, especially in multifamily buildings, where this is a bit trickier than single family homes. And this is something that came up in the community feedback survey in December as well, was that some of the people who did struggle with composting were those in multifamily buildings, both apartments and strata condo buildings. Um, and community feedback also showed very, very strong support for a single use plastic span by law, which was exciting to see. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so kind of the next phase slash current phase is community engagement phase two. So we had a first pop-up table on this past Saturday. There's another one happening this Friday on Earth Day. Um, and kind of just showing off key elements of the plan and have a big board of like every single action. So people don't have to like flip through, they can kind of just stand at the table and kind of look at the, the different actions to be as transparent as possible. Um, and then also having online and print advertising um, and then to get feedback on both taking notes at the pop-up events. And there's a little kind of comment box on the website that people can fill out their, their feedback. Um, just because there's been a lot of surveys and a lot of public engagement for the OCP and the active transportation plan coming up. So trying to target like which things are getting surveys. This one, not going to do a full on survey for this at this stage, but um, partially because it's also a much more technical document where we're making some of the decisions based on, you know, how many emissions they're going to reduce rather than, you know, other considerations. So, yeah. And that's uh, the end there. Leave it open for questions and comments. Okay, uh, I would suggest there are any general questions about process uh, before we get into the meat of the document. Uh, sure, let's do that. Um, so for council, what what is your time frame, and what, what do you anticipate getting out of this mm -hmm. stage and onto the next stage? Yeah, I think. Uh, this was referred to the advisory planning commission to try and get some insight you know, from this group to get your thoughts it'll feed into to cure and the, and the process um once uh consultation closes uh council would expect to see a revised draft uh, come back before council and i don't have a date in mind here i'm sure you when that likely would return june yeah i mean not a specific date but it depends on how much feedback there is and what degree of changes I think one of the best mechanisms, you know, coming out of today um, is also going to be that sort of record of, of uh, decision or record of discussion, as the case may be today, so that uh, that can be highlighted to council and, and uh, use that as perhaps a mechanism to see into plan as well. So follow up on that, because council has declared a climate emergency. I, I look at this document and it's obviously... Um, um, an update from the 2010, but I don't, I don't get the sense of urgency about it. I know there's a next phase and you'll be going into implementation, um, but I don't know how that can be stressed in this document that we are in a, we have a climate emergency going on and we have to more than just consult, council has to make some tough decisions around budgeting. 
Yeah, and I think as Kira mentioned, that that's one of the main catalysts for the for the plan is to feed it into the next budget cycle. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, but I think if that you know, and I'm sure that is consensus, and and that's something that should be reflected in the uh, notes of the discussion today around encouraging council to look to make some uh, uh, some urgent steps in terms of um, not just moving the plan forward, but the uh, the accountability of Senator going. Okay. And the other thing, I'm not, I'm no expert in this regard, but building up reserves because some of these projects will be massively, uh, they're usually expensive. And I don't know what the mechanism is to do that because some of these are like five and 10 year programs, so. Yeah, I think the first step was was initiated in this budget cycle in terms of establishing that reserve and the means to, uh, to uh, populate or fund that reserve moving forward. So that, uh, background work has been done in the current budget cycle. So I think uh, you can anticipate that there will indeed be, you know, um, in advance of the next budget cycle, an opportunity so that staff can actually see how much funding is in that reserve and access to in terms of making recommendations on actions. Good. Okay, those are my general questions. Thanks. Okay, yeah. Does that satisfy? I mean, I, I agree with you. I think the issue is not just one that's a technical issue or a budget issue. I mean, we're in a pro we've got a real problem. Last summer was an intimation of what's just going to come and it's going to get worse. Any other questions or comments on John? Well, uh, I guess it's a technical question. Yep. Um, as part of the building permit process in town, is it, does it require an energy audit to be done? My understanding, not right That's now. right. Yeah. Not, not at the present time. That's right. It's not currently part of the requirements. Because I, I did a project in North Spanish, mm -hmm. and they do require an energy audit. I think they've adopted the step code, have they not? Kira might be able to speak to that better. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Central Saanich has adopted the, the first phases of the step code as well, but Sydney has not yet. But it will become a requirement by the province in due course. So at that point, okay. we would be requiring it, if not sooner, direct emergency. Yeah, because I had to hire a separate consultant to do the audits. And mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and also, they were upgrading it, I think, uh, at the time that I did it. It was moving to the next stage. In December, um, it'll be required across the province for all buildings to meet step three. So There's a question for uh, later where we're going, that we're, we'll be talking about building. So, yeah, just keep that in mind then. Okay, any others? Okay, uh, I will uh, keep notes as we go along and so that I can also uh, come up with at least a draft of the record of comments and all of that. And uh, the idea then is that uh, are, are you're keeping notes too? Yeah. And we can, we can, we can, yeah, it's recorded on Zoom. Well, we're, we're, and it's recorded on Zoom. Well, so I, well I, noted. I want to yeah, take notes too. Okay. Yeah. Go, go on. Yeah, we're all keeping notes. <laughs> uh, but can my suggestion be that uh, at least the three of us circulate what we have and then we can uh, sort of consolidate? I don't mind putting in some time to uh, work on consolidating that as well. Okay. Uh, okay. So, the, the report itself, uh, where we are today, there's the background and uh, there's a, a number of headings there. Sydney today, what is climate change? Uh, what is climate action? Uh, are there any questions or comments that anybody would like to make with respect to that? Let me go through this fairly quickly, I guess. I guess one question for the researcher here, there is a mention, and it sounds like a fantastic program, this low carbon resilience. Um, sure, page? Page, I'm sorry. <laughs> My page, it says 14 of 52, but... Okay. Um, or it's a joint approach between SFU and local governments. Is this an ongoing program that we can 
that the municipality can access. It sounds like, um, you know, rather than every local government trying to do their own research, if there's a pool of information and then you can work from there to move forward as opposed to everyone doing their own research. Yeah, so the low carbon resilience original project is now closed from SFU, but um, they do have a lot of resources available online that I've been kind of looking through and going from as they're useful and they're coming out with more stuff um, as a result of this project, more like finalized uh, kind of support guidance documents for local governments to, to look at. But uh, to become a part, part of the project team, that, that part of the project has closed. Anybody else? The fact that uh, a large part of the implementation hinges on federal and provincial, I'll say, funding and decision making. Um, what steps can we be doing to move that along better than that process currently does? Because the provincial and federal approval and funding level is just painful beyond description. Do you mean? We waited for that. Uh, do you mean like what can staff do to encourage higher levels of government to do more no, work or no, what we can we put do? it on staff just we as a community we, yeah mm. yeah sorry at, at the micro picture which is mm. which is the town of sydney that we're discussing right now right what can the town of sydney be doing to push provincial and federal regulations approvals and funding along i mean I'd say the classic answer just from the top of my head is, you know, write to our elected officials mm -hmm. or to government, share your support for this kind of work, um, you know, voting for people who want to do this work. Um, but I don't know if I'm allowed to say that in like a local government plan <laughs> to help people to vote for. <laughs> yeah. I think I think it's being recorded. I think it's something too that our council could potentially take as an issue to the Union of BC's municipalities mm -hmm. annual conference. And that's kind of the place where local governments can advocate for things to the province and try to push for things together. So that might be a, an avenue. Yeah, that's actually a really good one. So you because know, the uh, government, the provincial governments really pay attention to the Union of BC municipalities because the mayors and councillors that go there are their recruitment grounds for, you know, for candidates. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I don't say that facetiously, that, that really is true. That's because people make their way up political. I would also add as well that, you know, there was a huge outcry from the whole governments after the CARIP program was shuttered this time last year, mm -hmm. um, Climate Action Revenue Incentive Program, which is a lot of just consistent, non-competitive funding. Um, and it, like it came out at UBCM and just local governments all over the place were just telling the province that this wasn't going to work. And it sounds like that they're going to come out with some kind of replacement for it. So speaks to the value of advocacy if we are all united. <laughs> what, are the two big, what are the two yeah. biggest obstacles that the town itself specifically at your level face with respect to liaison with provincial and federal authorities? I mean, I would say like just the channels, like where whether there's opportunities at all, because I try and go to as many of the kind of local government engagement um, opportunities as come in my inbox. Um, but if you know if they're not asking for our feedback, you know there's not really an avenue to give it unless I'm just going out of my way to call someone. Right. Um, I found it very challenging to navigate. Yeah. Trying to find the <clears throat> call and getting those contacts. Yes. Super challenging. Yeah. Seems like the, the provincial government's taking a very top down attitude these days. But even the provincial government's a lot easier to access than the federal government. I've never yeah. really had anyone. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. uh, and the lesson being that things happen at the local level. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have one comment. I don't hear another one. Uh, there's one on page seven or 18 as it appears on the agenda adaptation and mitigation. A Venn diagram. A diagram. And you know, they're obviously very important. We mitigate the impacts and we adapt to the changes that have happened. But I'd kind of like to see a third category there, prevention. 
In other words, we stop things from happening so that we don't have to mitigate. Some of the language here, like mitigation means reducing emissions prevention right. and adaptation, like responding to the, um, the risks after they, like the impacts as they're happening. Right. Um, some the the lingo that we use usually mitigate isn't with reducing emissions proactively. Yeah. I, I see what you're saying. So yeah. that's just that's kind of in the the climate kind of professional <laughs> kind of world. That's the words that we use. But I've heard it used politically that mitigate is kind of accepting the fact that climate change is here and now we're going to figure out this ways to, how do we accept yeah, mm -hmm. just ex we've accepted it. Now we're going to find ways to live within it. And uh, as long as there's that proviso that, you know, we want to take steps that we don't produce as much so that we don't have to mitigate, but we actually prevent things from getting worse. Yeah. Yeah. In my, in my mind, in like kind of the climate action staff kind of world, that would be considered adaptation. I think Sydney, more so than maybe a lot of the other municipalities, offers a unique opportunity where we have a high percentage of retired residents who are super passionate about their community. Everybody is in their municipality, but I think especially in a small seaside town where things are more condensed. And I think we have a great opportunity for community residents to help propel that whole provincial federal engagement and researching it. A lot mm -hmm. of them have the time to do it and they're passionate about doing it. Let's say use our residents who are willing to be used and abused. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, they're smart people. They know how to navigate a lot of that stuff. Yep, I would agree, yeah. Um, Kira, I, I just had a question. I was really astounded to read on page 15 that the town became carbon neutral in 2015. And I know that, you know, as residents of the town, we are not carbon neutral, but how did the town itself, like how did that work? Like as a corporation, how did they become carbon neutral that quickly? And how can we as residents of the town, or how can we encourage people living in this town? Like, what do we need to do to become carbon neutral that fast? And I, I'm figuring there must be some benefit that the town is taking from trees or something that's allowed them to show themselves as carbon neutral already. Yeah, it's kind of a, a tricky spot, I would say, is in this, this piece here. Um, with the official reporting mechanism, because this was determined through kind of higher level <laughs> methodology. They're like, okay, everyone, this is how you see how many emissions you're producing and how you account for those. Um, local governments were permitted to use um, waste diversion through the CRD program, kitchen scraps program, to offset local government emissions. Mm. Um, so that's how technically the local government was considered carbon neutral under their you know, statutory requirements. The town itself, I would say, is not well, you actually <laughs> carbon neutral. Oh. <laughs> it's kind of a calculation a based on our, yeah, like a bookkeeping. Yeah. yeah. I was just wondering, wow, how can we yeah. benefit from this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, as a builder, I can tell just by looking at this room. <laughs> there so, are yeah. still emissions. This Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. No. But, but that really raises an important question. How can we be confident that we have a reliable mechanism which is actual carbon neutrality rather than simply a mathematical formula like offsets are things used by corporations too. So they can happily pollute because they can purchase their mm -hmm. offsets mm -hmm. from somebody that's else. That's, yeah. Yeah. that's basically what the Kitchen Scraps program was is that it would offset the local right. government's emissions. And um, because Sydney is so small, it was enough to offset all of the emissions. Um, if we were a larger municipality that say owns several rec centers or ice sheets or other facilities mm. that produce a lot more emissions, then that wouldn't have been possible because Sydney is a relatively low number of emissions just because of our population and area and number of buildings. It, it was enough to kind of yeah. on the books, balance it out. Okay, great. That's a great answer. I was just wondering, I read it and I thought, wow, this is awesome. 
how do we all do this? <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, not my favorite part of yeah. GHG accounting. Okay. In the region. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. Excuse me, can I add some points? Yeah, Denny, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I had the same question about this page as well, and I was surprised that the savings there, and I'm wondering whether or not it can, it's linked to a different question, which is essentially, how do you measure um, the uh, the greenhouse gas gases in our community? And is, is the base, is the base, is the science behind the basis of that number real and, and concrete? Is it meaningful? Because we're gonna be using that as a benchmark moving forward. So I'm not sure whether, how reliable the, these calculations are. And, uh, you know, I think uh, something that you need to keep in mind as we go forward. Um, another issue is the issue of, um, of uh, you know, the federal and provincial government. And I agree, it's, it, it, it risks being a real mess because, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know how we're gonna move forward. Once we get to the, the end of the process and we have a kind of an action plan, I assume we'll be identifying priority areas and moving forward and making some decisions on what we do or don't do. And it'd be good, useful to have a forum where you could exchange what you've done, best practices, lessons learned, things to avoid, and instead of working in glorious isolation. So maybe when you get to the end of the process, some thoughts about how do you create a structure for information sharing uh, at various levels. Some initial thoughts. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Can I respond to that? Um, I would say the corporate GHG emissions calculations, I mean, it is a formula that was passed down from the provincial government, but I would say that that is relatively reliable in terms of how GHG emissions can be calculated. Um, the offsets, not so much, but the actual calculation for our gross corporate um, emissions that we produce, I would say is, is decent. Um, I calculated those myself around this time last year using their methodology. And, you know, I look at our BC Hydro numbers and I look at our Fortis numbers and I like calculate all of those using the, you know, latest numbers for how to translate in energy to emissions. So I would say those are decent. I would say those are a lot more accurate than the community ones because mm -hmm. those have a lot more inferred information used um, compared to corporate, but I would just note that. Um, and in terms of information sharing, I will highlight as well, there is like an intermunicipal working group that meets four times a year. So all the climate staff or representatives meet from across the region um, to kind of problem solve and talk about uh, what's going on. So. Can I follow up on your question, Denny? So on these two graphs, the corporate GHG emissions inventory and community one, it might be useful then to have um, where this information is, how you're basing this information, like it's based on CRD data mm -hmm. or some reference as to how those numbers are derived. I think that would be useful, Denny. So are you, you say yeah. affect then that this should be edited here to reflect accurately what we're actually looking at. Uh, just the source. No, well, just the source, source, source of information, of information. The information and how it's calculated. So that yeah. We know exactly. I mean, the explanation well, was a good one. Yes, that, for sure. Uh, Absolutely. We can calculate what we are using because we do get Ford's bills and Hydra's bills mm -hmm. and gas, all that sort of stuff. But the offsets kind of mess the whole thing up because you can just eliminate, eliminate the stuff you're actually doing. Yeah. 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 So, so, and I think as back to Andrew's point, the community is quite bright. They'll say, well, where do these numbers come from? So yeah. if that was incorporated into the document, I think that might resolve a lot of questions. Yes. It could even be added as an, like an appendix C or something like here's how to yeah. mm -hmm. a general overview of how these numbers were sourced potentially. Yeah, and so, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, so for these community emissions as well, it might be interesting then to also show um, per capita what are what mm -hmm. kinds of emissions we are creating because that way people in their own households too can sort of see mm -hmm. how they measure up i think people will be interested in, in it in a personal way that way as yeah well. yeah and that information is easily accessible i just yeah yeah, yeah. if i could just interject i my preference would be actually to see that 
in the text a bit more than rather than an appendix because so that people can actually know what actions are meaningful and what actions aren't because of the calculations, how the calculations are done. For corporate or community? Both. If the community emissions come from uh, the CRD directly, they do the emissions inventories for everyone in the region. So I've just pulled these from their report and Excel document. So those aren't, um, like the full methodology isn't necessarily publicly, well, it is in their report, they show, they have like explanations, but um, like their Excel spreadsheet wouldn't necessarily be. But you could say it's based on yeah. data from the capital regional district and give this that mm -hmm. source of people you know, that does, it does say that. Yeah, it does say that in here. In, in the text, but not on the actual. Oh, on the graph, you mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Yeah, it, and again, just not to, to push the point too mm -hmm. hard, but, you know, we okay, we get an idea of how well we're doing. It'd be nice to know as me as a as a citizen, what am I doing mm -hmm. well and what am I not mm -hmm. doing well? Like, where do we have to actually focus our attention? Mm -hmm. Rather than say things are just dropping, that's good, or they're going up. Why? And then what is it that's making, what's driving things on an individual level? Because this is a climate action plan for all of us, right? I think we'd be yeah. really surprised to find out how people jump in if they knew. Yeah. I yeah. Agree. I think it's really great the way in the document, the tables show for the town what's a high priority and uh, what they're going to put resources towards right away. And and then there's those really nice green areas about what you can do underneath, which are great. And they're great general information. But if they could also show what is going to be the biggest bang for your buck as a consumer, like what you can do, uh, or as an individual living in town, is what I mean. Um, I think that would really help people. I also wondered, and I might have missed this, in that same first section that we were looking at that was talking about existing conditions, where I asked about um, how did the town achieve carbon neutrality? There was also uh, something in there about per capita, uh, what we're committed to be is 30% below 2007 emission levels by I think it was 2020. Yeah. Did we make that target? Like that wasn't clear to me. And I kind of wondered, oh, how are we doing about this? Good question. I don't know why I didn't put that in there. So I will look into that. Yeah. And do you know offhand, Kira, how we're doing or not? Mm, not offhand. Okay. Sure. Could you say that that stat again that you were hoping to see in there? Yeah, it said um, per capita. We were, as, as individuals, supposed to be 30% below 2007 emission levels by 2020. And were you just wondering what are those 2007 emission levels? No, I'm wondering whether we made it, whether well, we I'm actually... I'm 99% yeah. sure we did not make it. Yeah, but... <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm kind of wondering where are we in the yeah. scheme of things here? Because just as an extra context, um, I think it is a little bit in here somewhere in um, the community inventory talks about it, but um, there has been a small reduction. If you just look at, you know, 2007 versus 2020, um, but that's largely due to both like the economic crash in 2008, nine, 10, and the emissions going down a lot from that. Yeah. And then just like steadily increasing since again. Then. Yeah. So it hasn't really had any reductions since like 2009 ish okay um, it's just like the difference between mm. like when we crashed and how far back to where we were <laughs> yeah back. yeah and i did see the text about that about how that was influenced by that big financial crash in 2008 and then later again by covid when everybody stayed home so they weren't driving their cars right so as a result we got a bonus <laughs> in terms of uh, addressing climate change with vehicle emissions. Okay. Uh, any other comments on the internet? What about existing conditions? We've looked at a bit. Any more there that you want to look at? This is a small point, but. Um... 
when we talk about corporate inventory, I almost prefer that you just keep using the word town right through the document. Corporate sounds unfriendly and it does switch back and forth between corporate and town. Okay. Um, th that's up to council's call there, but. I think if I could just comment on that, um, going back to the original climate action plan, the words corporate and community were used to differentiate the town of Sydney operations emissions versus the community emissions. If we just said town emissions, it might not be clear to the reader about, are we talking about the whole town of Sydney being residents, private property owners and mm -hmm. the local government town of Sydney? Or are we talking about just municipal operations? Right. So that's why those two words are used. I, I agree, corporate sounds very bureaucratic and not super friendly, <laughs> but yeah, if there's a way to clearly differentiate it, but still, yeah, yeah sound welcoming and, sure. and warm. Private industry. Could you use the term like local government? Mm. Yeah, maybe think about that, yeah. Uh, I've also got a question in this section about this, uh, the town's community, community risk assessment reviews that does uh, periodically. I wasn't aware of this. Uh, and I assume this is all, this all goes through the emergency planning process that meets the community meets occasionally. So I found it interesting and I don't know whether or not uh, there have been trends or there have been uh, major differences that they've noticed over the years in terms of what, what's, what's, what, what they're seeing as, as risks. And I would assume there are because we, fires are certainly something and, and, and sea rise levels. Um, so I, I just wanted to know, is this something that, that, that the town talks about? I mean, I wasn't aware this was ongoing. Um, is this something that the public is generally aware about? Is there, would it be useful having a kind of a background and saying, this is what this is all about and this is what the town's done and this is the, these are the key, key sort of findings we, we've, we've come, to, uh, come to recognize as being more important? Something to think about. Uh, okay, I can do a small comment on that. It is um, primarily housed under, yeah, the emergency management department within the fire department. Um, they hire, they work with a consultant to develop this hazard risk assessment every three to four years. I don't know the entire process as to like who they work with in terms of committees, um, but I think that the plan is to do an update of this this year potentially. So. Um, not sure what degree of confirmed that is, but that's, that's my understanding. Um, but yeah, I can ask and bring it up with the folks in charge of that. Sorry, Danny, your suggestion was just to include some more information in the climate action plan about what is the community risk assessment and how it's done. Yeah. And and, and maybe just, uh, you know, over the past, you know, I don't know how many, how often it's done, but the past, uh, you know, 10 years or 15 years, you know, the things, these are the key things that have come up or this is what's changed more recently that, and that gives us, because that would feed into some of the, some of the risks we're facing as a community with climate change and sea rise levels, rise levels and a whole bunch of other things. So I, it might be interesting just, just to have a, a, a couple of sentences in that section. Like, this is what it's about. This is what it's meant. Okay. Okay. Any other comments? I just I'll make one myself here on the page, I guess 16 where it's supporting policy. There's a, I like that diagram. I, I think that's good. I, th I think uh, that does an effective job of uh, showing what the community is doing and, and what you want to build into our structure actually deals with the whole issue. So that, that's, a, that's really effective. Borrow that structure from uh, Port Moody with their permission. I'll take full credit for it. No, it's good. <laughs> okay. The, the, then we, there's the path forward. Is there anything there that anybody wants to comment on? I think it's fairly straightforward. Okay, well, let's move to part two. And here's, I guess, some meat and potatoes 
issues here. Uh, there are these different categories, uh, the eight that have been identified. And, uh, and I think it's worthwhile to sort of look at each one and I will uh, go through them one by one. And then each of you can check if you have questions, address them to staff, comments that you might wanna make. Uh, and the first category is uh, town leadership. Any questions or comments? I, I like the way you've laid it out because you do have a sort of an action plan along with it. And that's something that I did my, for some context, my master's thesis on climate action planning in local governments um, and reviewed a number of climate action plans that were recent across the province. And this is kind of like the best practice um, among the most recent um, plans adopted across the province. So. One of the items on this list is embed a climate lens into decision-making processes. Could you talk a bit about how that would work? That is an excellent question, Denny. Um, <laughs> at this point, I think it's gonna be probably broken down more among staff, depending on what is the different, what are the different opportunities for that, whether that might be in staff reports or at budget decision-making. Um, I think there's gonna, this is gonna be kind of the big one to dig into among staff to see what people have the capacity to implement on a regular basis with consistency and, um, um, yeah. Yeah, can I add to that? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I agree that it, it would be something that say staff are looking at when we're preparing staff reports to council on development applications, on budget proposals, on projects, um, looking at things that we have in those reports. We usually have sections on say for a development application, how does it meet our OCP. How does it meet our zoning bylaw? Maybe this means having a section. How does it meet our climate action plan? Mm -hmm. And the same for our budget reports or sending draft budget items for for capital projects, individual projects. How does it help us achieve our climate action plan goals? Remembering to think of things from that perspective when we're even for council too, when they're making decisions, thinking of things from that climate action plan perspective. How does this decision either help us work towards those goals or slow us down? So it's, it's looking at things through that lens. I, I agree. I think that's, uh, that's a good way to look at this. I think you could see each, each document going to council might have a, would have a section on, on, on the climate lens and talk about it a bit. And in some cases, it may not be there at all. In some cases, it might be quite significant. I think that, that allows us to kind of compare how we're moving forward as we move across various files. Can I just ask a question about the, uh, in that whole town leadership actions and the tables that we see there. Um, and I really like the tables. I'm wondering um, if there is any, um, uh, if there's a reason why the tables were organized as they were. I'm wondering whether maybe all the high priority stuff should migrate to the top and be followed by medium and low priority but it's just kind of scattered. Um, and I don't know if that makes sense or not. And that's a great idea. As I was kind of doing some internal prep mm. for implementation workshops, I was like, hmm, it would have been helpful to organize this. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I'd, I'd organized it myself in terms of timelines. I seemed yeah. like what's ongoing short term, you know, yep. that way as well. But um, yeah, right now they're kind of organized by theme so like operations partnerships advocacy so you can kind of see yeah. what kind of projects but i think within those subcategories there can be some more organization yeah okay one, one thing i am not seeing here in the action plan is the the um sort of the single use uh idea um as, as applied to the city's operations okay. paperwork being one of them mm -hmm. um you know, the city is a, is a great generator of paper. Uh, we only have to look around this table to to understand that. And I, I don't. Uh, to me, there there there's there's another action plan there. Uh, same thing. We apply uh, single use plastics to businesses. Okay, we're going to eliminate those things. I think that the, the town itself and individuals have to also look within themselves and say, you know, we don't need all of this stuff. A 
that's a good one. That applies to many things, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> It, it does, and and, you, and you've got to start somewhere. And, yeah. and I, I I really think that uh, um, it, virtually all these climate action things are driven from the top down. The, the federal government to the provincial government to the municipal government. And it's it's right down to the only people, the only person that uh, the only way anything gets done is individuals have to do it. It's not going to be done by a town other than the town is going to put the bylaws in place or the plans in place, but it's going to be done by individuals, each and every individual in the town and, and treating the, the town as an individual business as compared to any other business. It's going to all be done by at the lowest level. Lucina. Um, on partnerships here in that same table, what the town is planning to do, as we're well aware of climate, um, Changes just don't happen at our border. I think this could be a, a fantastic opportunity to dovetail this partnership with Central Sandwich and North Sandwich and the OCP and the environmental issues in the peninsula to take that to another level and also deal with climate, um, climate issues. There was some talk, I believe there was an environmental group that did a study of the peninsula and this, this would follow quite closely with that if we, we supported some kind of um, joint position to look at climate changes on the peninsula. I think that would be uh, money well spent. Any other questions? Sorry, do you see that as like an additional action? Or well, you... right now just as partner with, to coordinate, um, local mitigation and that adaptation initiatives. I think that should be stronger and maybe even um, staff that as opposed to people just talking on the peninsula level. I guess, cause right now kind of what this alludes to is that the, um, the climate action staff at each of those three local governments and the CRD and broadly with the rest of the CRD local governments is, you know, we are in communication semi-regularly and talk about projects and you know how we can work together on projects as appropriate but um yeah there, there could be opportunity for for one additional kind of staff but i think the advantage of having kind of the staff within the local government and doing that is like we have control over things and like I guess together you might be stronger and come up with the broader perspective of how we can deal with climate change on the peninsula as opposed to every muni trying to do their own little projects. It's just another way of looking at that opportunity. <clears throat> yeah, the forest doesn't stop at the border between North Sandwich <clears throat> and Central Sandwich. Mm -hmm. A fire wouldn't stop either. I, I have a question. I'm going to go back to one of the original comments. And I, I like the idea of... Uh, the lens of the climate action plan being used in all departments, you know, does it meet it or not? So you get a proposal in any of the departments and you conclude that it doesn't meet. What do you do then? Do you reject it or, I mean, it, it's, it, it's, it's not a great plan if you decide uh, that you go ahead anyway because the mm -hmm. plans don't meet it. If then the lens doesn't make any sense. That would be up to council to decide how to proceed with that. And they'd have to weigh all the, cause they have to look at how does it meet our, all of the other plans too. The climate action plan is one plan for the town. And hopefully in an ideal world, everything would meet it and follow it every time. That's not always going to be possible. So, I mean, council will do their best, but they'll have to make that decision and think what is in the best interest of the community here to do this or to do this or to find some other option that meets everything better. So yeah, I don't know what they would do if the proposed project X doesn't meet it. That remains to be seen, but yeah. That's a big question because arguably that's probably climate may be the biggest factor in almost any decision we make right now, but. And even climate itself, you know, there's trade-offs in different ways that, you know, climate action, you know, having a multifamily building, mm. you know, in a good location, might cut down some trees, wouldn't be super great for our natural environment side, but could be really great for our, you know, putting people close to businesses and transit to reduce, you know, yeah. transportation emissions. So mm -hmm. the trade-offs even within climate action alone can be tricky. <laughs> of course, it's a, fun, it's a fundamental uh, 
contradiction in development period. Yeah. Well, you develop, you're making a bigger problem. But even reviewing reviewing budgets and deciding which capital projects, which roads to repave to maintain that infrastructure that's been invested in, you keep doing it like you've been doing it for decades, or do you change to be more more climate friendly? And then there's a cost in that too. So it's which cost makes the most sense. Mm. Another question I've got, if you don't mind, is the whole issue of, uh, and maybe it fits in this section. It's it's um, whether do, whether we would like an annual report on on the towns. Uh, and the towns are working to address cl climate change or, or, or the mitigation efforts. Is that something, without getting to a large bureaucratic process, if, 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 you, if you don't take stock and report on what you've done or haven't done or what's worked or hasn't worked, how do you know you're going in the right direction? Not sure how to answer that. Uh <laughs> part of the implementation. Yeah, it could be part of the implementation. I don't know if, if I have like the decision making power to say that we're going to do an annual report. I think that could be a good idea. Yeah, I but. think monitoring the how the implementation is going like that's an essential part of any plan is to do that monitoring and assessment to see how is it working? Is it working? Are we making any progress? And to follow up with that is important. But yeah, how that will be done and the frequency of, of that reporting out remains to be seen. As, 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 as long as it's captured somewhere, this idea of, of reporting and, and stock taking and lessons learned, I think that's really important. And there are a lot of examples out there of, you know, local governments having dashboards where they say kind of, you know, this is how we're doing, this is progress we've made or we haven't made, or these are actions that we've, you know, completed, like this many actions have been started this year. Um, lots of different approaches to it as well, depending on staff capacity and budgeting. This is also going to be a very organic exercise, I think. I mean, you, you're planning to go from A to B and all of a sudden C shows up or an event happens and you find out, oh, it's not that, it's this. And so it, it's, it's, it's going to retire the choir, the, the, the town to be nimble on its feet as it moves forward and adjust. And having that story told, I think, is, a good, is good for people to understand the complexities of it and maybe helps educate them on their role as individuals and in trying to reach the, these objectives as well. I think another kind of angle as well is just making sure that we have, you know, the whole, all of town staff on board as much as possible. We're actually going to be implementing this every single day. You know, I've heard from other local governments who are trying to implement climate action plans and, you know, maybe they haven't had the same amount of like staff outreach to make sure everyone knows <laughs> what we're doing and what the goals are. And then it gets really hard to actually bring any of it to life because, you know, you're going, hey, this is this plan that we've made and now you have to implement, like, please read now, you know? <laughs> um, so versus trying to get buy-in throughout the whole process, which is kind of the approach I've tried to take here. So. Um, can I just make a comment about the transportation and mobility section? Well, we're gonna get to that one. Oh, we're, we're, oh, we're not there yet. Okay, no, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. We're on the town still. Okay. Very good. Any other uh, comments on the town? Okay, let's go to infrastructure and then we'll do that one after that. Any uh, comments? So you, uh, as Kira did make uh, observations on this, so she introduced it. So yeah, Lucina. So on the action infrastructure, what the town is planning to do, action and cost. Now, I'm not entirely clear whether to develop an asset management plan, the cost of that is very high or the actual implementation mm. is high. Same thing with stormwater study and the last one high to very high. So are these costs to do the actual studies? And I don't mm -hmm. know, there's no indication what high means. Like, yeah, it's in, that... the, it's in the how to read the plan section. So if the cost to do the plan is high, to actually do the infrastructure improvements is going to be extremely high. Depends on what it is. So the cost high means 20,000 to 200,000. Big range. Very high <laughs> means 200,000 plus. Um, so the development asset management plan, that is the, the cost is high to very high because they're trying to do um, 
pretty sophisticated asset management plan um, to kind of start us off strong uh, for the long-term asset management within the town. Um, but yeah, I mean, these kinds of studies, they could say, oh, like this relatively low budget change could actually have a really big impact, you know, good bang for a buck. And so then maybe we have like actually a medium or a high cost for a certain thing. But I mean, this is gonna, when, when we're looking at infrastructure, that's like upgrading pipes potentially or naturalizing coastlines. So those could really range from like small projects just to like fix a pipe here versus like completely changing like a shoreline. Right, but so. just so we're clear, this is not to do any of those things, but just Correct. to do the plan. Yeah. Right. Because the plan, if the development asset management plan, that will identify what projects are priorities um, over the following, you know, X many years. So it would be useful because this is going to be the underpinning for the whole town and the asset management plan to give a time frame to that because really we can't move forward with any the other infrastructure changes mm -hmm. unless we have that plan in place. So yeah. well the there's asset a, yeah there's a timeline set up for the asset management plan mm -hmm. currently I suppose that could be referenced in here specifically that the yeah. it, council does have I know it's listed as a prior high priority and, and council does have a uh, budget in place uh, in this year and apply for a, a grant uh, as well to move that forward over the next this budget cycle and the next budget cycle. They're applying for three grants, the consultants, because they, they already have the consultants. So technically this project is actually underway, um, but they've, because they've hired consultants already and they're going to be applying for three grants. Um, so it's going to be a pretty big project. It's going to take, you know, I think off the top of my head, potentially like the next, mm -hmm. within the next kind of five years wrapping up, but it's going to take a while to actually go through all of the assets. I don't want to speak too into detail about engineering projects though, because I don't want to mislead us or confuse us. But um, you know, if it's something that I can I can look into as well. Um, I'll just say one more thing before we leave this section. The infrastructure, I believe in Saanich um, developers, and I don't know the size of the project, they're required to deal with their stormwater management on site. And I see this as something that is just gently suggested, suggested here. So um, maybe that should move up the priority a bit because um, with extreme rainfall events, um, that is a concern. And I see you do have pictures in here of Sydney, you know, some streets underwater. So you mean like private developments, like managing stormwater on site? Hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, right. anybody else uh, comments on this? Just a general question, uh, the issue of high, high, medium, low priority, I guess at the end of the day, and this may be discussed in the implementation part would be, when you look at these six or seven action areas and their highs and lows and mediums, how do you, how do you, what's your action plan for going forward in, 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 in uh, as, as this thing begins to uh, have lit, it takes some life? And uh, they, they will certainly link as part of, I guess, the town's overall strategic strategic planning process, uh, maybe a separate section dealing with, with climate change, uh, because I agree the numbers in some cases could be very high, uh, in some cases maybe maybe less than, than we think. So that question I had in my mind too. So what does high mean and how does high in, 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 in infrastructure compare with high in some other part of uh, a thing like land use, for example? Something that's going to have to be discussed later on. Yeah, just generally for context, um, all of like these tables were developed in departmental workshops. So I sat down with every single department in the town and we went through each action to figure out all of this information um, at a high level. And so going forward, you know, in my you know, camp chart work plan, I'm hoping to have some implementation workshops in the coming months with, again, each department and go more into detail about like, when do we wanna do this? Where does it fit into our current you know, long-term plans? Um, are we gonna have budget for it? Do we need to apply for grants? And all those questions. Um, the priority was generally loosely assigned based on like the timeline that it might fit, the level of impact it would have um, and the costs. So it's kind of like a high level brainstorming exercise among staff for like where it fits among all those different elements. 
So just uh, like a clarification as well, for the infrastructure here, you're, the focus seems to be mostly on uh, water and drainage, right? I mean, roads are infrastructure too, and there's a lot of other things that are infrastructure, and we're looking at transportation next, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, am I correct in assuming sort of that that's what the focus is here? That's generally the focus here, yeah. I was looking more at like the adaptation side for like preparing our like underground more so infrastructure for water risks, generally speaking. Yeah. Does that include uh, hydro and all of that too? Because that's uh, not ours, but. Yes. Um, well, oh, EC Hydro, I'm not sure. Um, I think a lot of that is kind of wrapped in the, the fourth one there, review opportunities to manage projected risk of sea level rise on infrastructure. Um, because one of the issues that was raised that I think is mentioned in the plan, right, okay. or at least a previous draft, um, you know, we might need to raise all of our infrastructure in like the Talista Park area to like not be underwater in the future, or do we want to have dikes. So like different questions, because that would be both pipes and electrical and, and all of that. So can I just suggest with these actions that they may be defined a little bit more, like asset management, yeah. You know, and then the, under the bullet so that people know when they're reading, like the fourth one, hard and soft infrastructure adaptation, what that means. Yeah. The or, challenge is how to like, keep it really readable and succinct versus, yeah. you know, versus understanding. Versus, <laughs> well, and, you know, I try my best <laughs> to make it as understandable, but it's, it's tricky with really technical yeah. Yeah. Like infrastructure. Yeah. yeah. I guess what I'm missing as a, I guess I'm not a planner. I'm, coming from the other end of the system, but uh, I see, I don't see prioritizing in any of this, you know, I mean, they're all kind of listed equally and, you know, is building dikes more important than, uh, you know, uh, controlling uh, stormwater on, a, on an individual property or, you know, or, you know, what, what is all of this saying to us, <laughs> you know, because I've seen, I've seen development, town developments, for instance, where the stormwater control is a big deal and it's like back to the future. You go back to ditches again or something like that. Uh, or, uh, you know, but then here we are raising houses up, you know, six feet above the ground compared to their neighbors, uh, when in fact, you know, maybe there will be dikes in the future, whatever. So it's, it, you know, there's no prioritizing of, of actions. Uh, that lead me as a technical guy to say, you know, this is how this is how it's all how it's all dovetailing. Challenge is it's hard to prioritize these things when we haven't actually done any of the studies yet to say yeah. what we're going to do or not do. Um, I think that's where the asset management plan really comes into play because that it covers as as was just said the, that the roads are an integral part of our infrastructure as well, not just for getting vehicles around, but that this is an asset that we've invested in that we have to maintain. And looking at the, the, that as an asset of the town and the electrical, every other type of infrastructure that could be impacted by heat or impacted by water or impacted from a different climate change over time. Yeah. So I think the development of the asset management plan and then doing the other studies will lead us towards these more finite decisions about what should new houses look like in terms of sea level rise, or what should our road repavement plan be based on our climate goals for reducing GHG emissions. Like once we do those first studies, then we can make mm -hmm. those decisions. But we have to be realistic and acknowledging we can't just stop everything and put a moratorium on all the changes until we have these things sorted out. We have mm -hmm. to keep yeah. rolling ahead mm -hmm. and right, do these plans in the meantime. So. Mm -hmm. The other part as well, just yeah. for this focus area, specifically with it all being high priority because there's only four of them and they're all over different timelines. Like the, the fourth one is gonna be quite a long-term one that probably won't come no. for a few years. Whereas asset management plan is happening right now. Um, and the stormwater alternative study is happening very soon as well. That's kind of why we put high because they're all gonna happen. It's, and so. It's just, I think I'm the oldest person in the room <laughs> here and uh, you know, over the years, I've seen the can kick down the road for a long time. So, you know, just, and, you know, those climate action goals just seem to keep receding into the, into the distance. So I'd like to see like a line develop sometime. 
where where it all starts to happen. Prioritizing having, priorities. Yeah. 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 Someone's having this kind of position here as well as, you know, someone can have the spreadsheet of all the things that we want to do and kind of run around and yeah. keep track of what's happening and what's not happening. But what about a lens of what action if we didn't take would have the worst consequences? I guess that's probably what the asset management plan is about too, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Transportation and mobility, Bernadine. Yeah, I I just wanted to comment that that uh, that pyramid chart uh, on the bottom of the first page there was uh, really great. Um, I didn't realize, you know, there's been so much, like the number one sort of the best thing you can do is trip reduction trip distance reduction. And I mean, with all of the um, programs and stuff you have nowadays having to do with electric vehicles, actually changing your fuel source is right at the top of the pyramid. So I just thought, wow, like this is an individual, this actually really kind of verifies the, the biggest item, right? Is so if we have people living close to downtown and they can walk everywhere, that is sort of one of the great assets that Sydney has already. From a global perspective, though, if everybody stops driving combustion engine vehicles and just drove electric vehicles, it would not change the emission problem we have. It's industry that's manufacturing mm. that, that is the problem. Well, it's a com combination of, of both. Yeah. We can't just industry tackle one and, and ignore yes. one. Mm -hmm and reach our goals, you know, both have to be done to reach the goals. Mm -hmm. You know, it would get us partway there for sure by reducing all the industry, but like what is industry producing? It's producing things so that we electric can buy cars. things. Producing <laughs> electric cars. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's also producing things that we can buy things. If we buy less things, then we're also reducing industry, right? Like it's all kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. But electric cars are still cars. I mean, yeah. I, years ago, yeah. I, researching buying a car and discovered that buying a used car is probably smarter than buying a new car because the pollution going into the building of a car and the carbon footprint is bigger than the life of what you're going to consume in terms it's of fuel. Mm -hmm. I will highlight that in the studies that they've done for EVs, I mean, I don't disagree. I think like it's better to focus on active transportation than just like switching all of our cars. Yeah. Um, because there's just not enough minerals for us to all just have EVs, <laughs> um, which some people like to conveniently forget. But um, <laughs> um, but in in the studies that they've done, it does show that even with like the life, like the cost, mm -hmm. the emissions production of making an electric vehicle, it's still overall better to drive an electric vehicle than a gas vehicle over the lifetime of the gas vehicle. It still produces more emissions than the creation of the EV in the first place. Mm -hmm. There's a question that does come up a lot is, oh, EVs are so intense to produce. And that's true, but it still doesn't outweigh the gas cars. The rare earth minerals in the mining. I mean, we can get into a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's great to, uh, you know, more efficient use of those minerals if we're all e-biking than taking, you know, an EV. So. <laughs> any, any, any other questions on the transportation here? I have one or two as well. Yeah, so there's, uh, there's no mention of car share. Sydney does have a number of mm. car share cars, and I thought, oh, how long are you? I don't believe that's mentioned at all. That's another alternative to people owning their own vehicle. And I was curious about this, this in the overview. The majority of people driving during the morning peak period are going between Sydney and North Saanich. Are they going to work, I presume? Mm. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head, but that was my understanding. It's from a CRD mode share study from 2017. We're not going into Victoria. The majority are going to uh, North Sound. Yeah. That, that kind of surprised me a little bit. Um, and I believe um, Vantage has an e-bike rebate program for residents. If Sydney could, you know, think about that, that would be fantastic. <laughs> well, I think you're... you're 
trips between Sydney and North Science, that's probably correct in, in as far as the cars in town are concerned. But by far the greatest number of vehicles in and around here have nothing to do with Sydney. They're going from Victoria to the ferries or Victoria to the airport. And mm -hmm. we have zero control over that, but that is where the majority of the transportation emissions are coming from is, is highway traffic. Right. We could reroute the highway away from town. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the, other, the other thing I would say on the table in the actions, transportation mobility actions, advocacy, I would say, um, this is a, a small point, but advo advo advocate, advocate for policy with service providers of transit, improve regional transit. The regional transit is actually pretty good. It's the local transit that's poor. I don't know if anyone here takes the bus, but going into town is great moving around the peninsula is is really hard i think regional and local yeah that, that would make me happier yep so what exactly do you mean by that or? so it says ask for better regional transit the regional transit's mm -hmm. quite good so you can get to the ferries you can okay. get into victoria you get to uvic sort of kind of uh it's just moving around the peninsula so i would say the local transit options are quite poor. The bus comes once every three days. <laughs> the challenge is that Sydney doesn't really have the population exactly. and the ridership right. to be able to support that. Kind of For route. sure. Yeah. yeah. Without increasing the density of Sydney, which, you know, is its yeah. own kettle of fish. Yeah. I'll, I'll defend the transit system a bit because one of their goals is what to have everybody within about 400 meters of a bus stop. And there are enough buses that go through Sydney that. You can for sure in Sydney, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's if you're if the if you follow that most of the um car traffic's between Sydney and North Saanich, that link yeah. is quite poor. Any other comments on actions here? Could you explain transportation demand management? Is that where you've got like commercial and residential in a building and you know, or uses that are used at different times of the day and not overlapping. Is that the idea? Transportation demand management strategies are kind of a, the fancy word that words that people use for um, having non-car alternatives to make up for not having all the required parking that, you know, oh. might be in the bylaw. Okay. Right, so like having car shares within the building, having you know really good quality bike parking, um, EV parking, those kinds of things. Um, so, okay, yeah. it could also include end of trip facilities. Like say they're doing a mixed use commercial development and they commit to having on the ground floor of the building a kind of a locker, like locker and shower facilities for okay. somebody commuting right. to that place of work by bike so that they have a way to comfortably get there by bike and not feel that they have to drive. So, yeah. I'm not used to the, the new Lingo. terminology. So I don't see much here. Just a question on multimodal transport. Like I think got bikes and scooters and people walking and cars and skateboards, I mean, the interface of that could be mm -hmm. kind of scary in places. And so is there some sense of developing a plan where we can have separated movement for a lot of people? Like some places in Europe, it's just wonderful. Do you have bikes and cars and people separated so nicely that you feel safe and you can get around in, in any one of those modes? Yeah, that's the um, intention behind the active transportation plan. OK, that's, that's what I was wondering. OK. Yeah, so that's where they're going to be looking at um, the actual network itself. But I didn't want to tread on too many toes for bringing too much of that into here. But um, yeah, definitely really, really important. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Pretty happy with that? I, I like the what can you can do sections at the end. I think that's that's a very useful addition to the, what you're doing here. Yeah, I wanted to make it 
friendly and not mm. like we're forcing everyone like you have to do this like right now I mean in my heart I'm like please do this right now <laughs> but <laughs> you know that's not necessarily always the most effective way to create change so well yeah and, and as much as you know the majority of the local traffic is basically remains local Mm -hmm. which was sort of imply that the majority of the local traffic is people going shopping or whatever. Uh, what, what sort of action plan would take that away, the vehicle away from that whole um, concept? You know, how, how are you going to get your groceries from, from the store to your home without a vehicle? On the, on the little carrier on the back of your bike? Not too likely. It, it depend, depends on your, you know, ability like i'm sure there's lots of people who are able to get you know those those cargo bikes um and there's cargo trikes and there's lots of different um like e-bikes that are coming out now especially where you know you can fit a lot of stuff on a bike but but what i was getting at is, is maybe the one of the action plans would be to develop that as a service rather than individuals mm -hmm. having to learn how to ride a three-wheeler or an e-bike or whatever and for an old fight guy like me, I tried an e-bike. They're heavy and they can kill you. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, but maybe there's there's room for the town to actually work on developing some sort of a, a, a transportation service that would pay groceries on, on a bike or something like that. You know, a, sort of like the, um, what do you call the things downtown that take the tourists around that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah a pedicab type of, type of thing. Um, Sydney, more so than most communities, and I think back to your thing about size, already offers a lot of mm. community-based um, opportunities where people can get volunteers who are literally, I know tons of people just on mm -hmm. my street who yeah. are literally doing volunteering for going to deliver groceries to prescriptions and grocery stores. There's every single grocery store the in our community delivers to. Yeah. But yeah. they're driving their car to do it. That's the that's grocery story. store is yeah. yes yeah but the ones like spud but, for well, but the difference in that is they're taking one van with multiple loads of groceries yeah versus yeah. 20 people getting in a car and going to yeah. The grocery store. yeah yeah and that's got to be a savings but that could that's something the town could also encourage by putting some structure in place for it should we can like look into but potentially yeah, like free parking on the street even providing something. residents with links to <laughs> yeah. some of those services yeah. i think would be useful. Yeah. Yeah. a lot of people just aren't even aware of the fact yeah. that someone will on a volunteer basis yeah. go get all that stuff maybe on a bike there's i've seen online like lately a few local delivery like bike delivery totally just little yeah entrepreneurs so starting up to deliver else. things to people I think COVID has made it happen, actually, because yeah. a lot of people are locked in their house and yeah. <laughs> they're not going anywhere. And, and again, because of our demographic, people mm -hmm. who are able-bodied and able to go out and get those things are willing to jump in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I, Andrew's point, I think, is really well taken. There's a lot of stuff available in Sydney that we don't know about, and it might be a role of council or and reports like this to educate, in other words, that that people know what's available because a lot of people don't know what's available. I know we talk to people we know and we say, well, did you know you could do this and you could get this provided? No, we didn't know that. Hmm. I guess there's some kind of like central hub for that information because I didn't yep. even know that those well, were yeah. I mean, so your, your town newsletter oh, goes off all the time and I know for a fact just about everybody reads the town newsletter here. Mm -hmm. Be, to do that. <laughs> about, like working with the, the BIA or the chamber to just increase Absolutely. awareness of the opportunities that yeah. are out there. So yeah, people out there. Right. walk to the grocery store, place their order, and just know that they can say, "Please deliver this," and walk away from the grocery store with just their coffee in their hand, 100%. and walk on home and have it dropped off of there. Yeah. So, we're in a very uniquely positive scenario in our community based mm -hmm. on size and mm -hmm. flat and different yeah. demographics. Yeah. No. yeah. No question. Okay. Uh, ready to move on to buildings? I think land, land use is next. Land use. Land use. Land use. Sorry. Any comments on this? Um, just the one we've all been through six and a half hours of OCP review. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, the DP areas, as they were designated, I don't believe specifically there were any designated for energy conservation. Um, so that you might want to just double check with planning staff on that. That is true. None were designated for energy right. conservation. Okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there's a DPA designated no. area for it, but a lot of the powers or a lot of the policies that would be put in one of those DPA specifics were kind of weaved within other DPAs. And there were a number of general oh. sustainability design guidelines that would pertain to every development permit area. So mm -hmm. Those are in the draft of CP. And those are kind of, that does kind of reflect, there's generally two approaches that local governments take with DPAs is either kind of weaving it into everything or having like a specific DPA for it. And there's pros and cons to both sides, but um, yeah, both have met a few precedents of different local governments. Yeah. Respect to land use and specifically industrial land use. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that is a huge contributor to negative emissions. Um, is that part of a DP requirement um, or so else and maybe? Um, on the industrial side of Sydney, where maybe larger concentrated forms of emissions are being generated. Is that part of um, DP applications where huge warehouses that are being built have to contribute something somehow, or is it site specific and they just have to do their own thing within their building? It isn't currently in our OCP or in the current design guidelines, and I can't recall a specific guideline about that in the draft. I'd have to check. Do we have any industry in Sydney that does pose an emission problem? I mean, usually, mostly it's warehouses and clean stuff, right? Well, there's there's a number of industries over there. You're probably familiar with what's over there as well. I mean, we've got metalworking, we've mm. got building, we've got slags. That's a big warehouse. And anybody with HVAC equipment is producing some kind of emissions. There are large buildings over there that are climate controlled. There's ones that have very high tech things being manufactured. And then we've got chemical manufacturing happening over at Sea Star Boat Building, which has its own climate risk. But yeah, I don't. Can't, we're not we're not processing asphalt. There's nothing, no nothing smoke. like major fumes or anything coming in. No smokestacks. More elect like how much? No, energy? but there's a lot of chemical stuff, like especially in the marine the marine area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, to do with fiberglassing and and all maintenance and that sort of thing. Right? And all the all the outflow from those sites is monitored by the CRD. Mm -hmm. so what's going down the drains and the storm drains. That's all monitored regularly by the CRD. But I can't think of any specific business. Maybe you can in the industrial area that's that's a, a red flag in terms of emissions or GHG production. The main question would be like what how are they sourcing their energy? You know, are they running on mm. natural gas because it's cheaper than BC Hydro? Probably a pretty good likelihood. I can't say for any specific you know, company, but um, unfortunately, local governments currently do not have the authority to regulate what energy sources people use. There is whispers and rumors that that could change in the coming, you know, year or two, potentially, who knows? Um, I mean, it's being implemented but, in residential construction with the step of um, and Leeds was a version from the commercial and industrial. But with step code, we're not allowed to say you can't use Fortis, you know, we, we can't regulate whether they use natural gas or electricity, but that could be changing, maybe. Hmm. I think, but like, we'll have to see. <laughs> we'll have to see. <laughs> yes. Um, this, this issue of, of energy and, and energy measurement and, and efficiency, the first action item on, 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 on this section talks about incorporating energy efficiency guidelines. So are we sort of saying that this is something we think we should do be doing as we develop the OCP? You mentioned it's not, it's not there yet and, and as such, but uh, I find that interesting as well, uh, um, that something this is maybe we should, uh, we should think about it. Uh, as I said, I think there is something in the draft OCP in those general sustainability guidelines that pertain to all the development permit areas. And that's why it says it's underway. 
Okay. And it's within the OCP costs, high priority, meaning it's it's happening right now in the draft OCP. All right. I, just, I can't reference a specific policy right now. Some of it's building design as well. You know, like That's how right. do we orient our buildings mm -hmm. to, you know, get the most solar gain or like mitigate solar gain or reduce solar gain in the summer with trees, you know, deciduous trees versus other ones, you know, yeah. there's lots of little pieces that we can kind of weave together to address this. Yeah. Okay, any other We're comments? still talking about land use or? We We're we... still on land use. Okay, uh, balance hard and soft surface areas to enhance climate change resilience. Uh, you know, I, I mean, it seems like the general trend in town is uh, densification. And a lot of the projects that we've looked at uh, on the APC result in uh, not much green space. <laughs> so I don't think we're following through on that particular objective very well in town at the present time. So I just, I think that's a very important point. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. And we should make sure we take that into consideration in the future. Mm. That's not necessarily saying like, we're never going to have another parking lot. It's just saying maybe, you know, there's a couple more small car parking spots where we can have like a nice big tree that grows and like provides shade over the lot. So we don't have as much, you know, heat island effect happening. As long so, as there's some root area for the tree. You know, as long as there's root area, but you know, those kinds of things can be. Yeah. There's different opportunities. Well, you're, you're sort of talking about footprint then too. The footprint yeah, is the one yeah. We've seen so developments where open site space. virtually the whole site was <laughs> mm -hmm. asphalted, where, where uh, there was no building. Well, yeah, it, all the that the draft OCP does have design guidelines for more open space on site. So APC would have just recently seen those. But even if the even if the building is not covering the whole site, we're finding that the parking, parking. spaces underneath definitely cover the whole site wall. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Which means you're not going to grow your tree on top of that parking. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking about one particular project, but I mean, <laughs> it applies to a lot of projects. Yeah. This comes to the point that I think Kira made earlier that, you know, building a multi store building that's close to parking, close to transportation, shopping, uh, more, more bicycle, more, more foot traffic will, will, will save uh, uses of energy going forward, albeit there are fewer trees in the neighbors. And the question is, how do you balance, how do you balance action in one area against act, inaction in another area? And at the end of the day, are we going in the right direction? I don't know how you I don't know how you ever make that that calculation. How about one 16 story building instead of four four story buildings? No. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, but I think run you how about you go to the next I council meeting and present that? <laughs> <laughs> think of all that land you'd open up to grow trees on. Green but space. think of the precedent you'd set. <laughs> yeah. But I think it also applies to public versus private land. I mean, boulevard trees, for instance. Mm -hmm. can offset a lot of, you know, the stuff that's missing from private property. Anyway, uh, so I thought, you know, I think there should be more emphasis on what the town is giving in terms of landscape. Yeah. Well, and, and this can relate to buildings too. There's a, <clears throat> I've watched a program on Japan where they're incorporating a lot of gardening mm -hmm. into, mm -hmm. into buildings. In Singapore, they have actually mandated yep. that you cannot build a building unless you're replacing all of your ground area with green space somewhere on that yep. building on the front of the top. Right front now. top, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't look pretty much still at night. Anyway, anything else on this? Then we get to buildings. There doesn't seem to be much discussion about building envelope, uh, unless I missed that. Uh, I mean, I realize we're talking about standards, but you know, uh, the way a building envelope is put together is very important to, I mean, to avoid having to heat the building at all. <laughs> As you said before, orientation uh, plus the the envelope, uh, very important in uh, in the whole story rather than talking exclusively about fuel. Mm -hmm. I'd say that would be addressed through like the policy and regulations actions. You know, we can address building envelope through step code and through 
changes in you know the zoning bylaw potentially um but yeah definitely something that we would keep you know in in our mental file for when we get to updating those those regulations mm -hmm. is oh one absolutely thing. yeah one thing i uh, went interesting in this section was the comment on i guess the first page where it talks about uh, uh, building emissions um Heating oil, oil, approximately 12% of energy used, but 30% of building emissions. I found that really striking. And I don't, uh, so, uh, and maybe that issue could be reflected as one of the actions. I mean, if the, if the town were to lobby for, you know, provincial governments to sort of step in to provide more and more, more uh, uh, funding to encourage people to get off oil and to electricity, hopefully, that's something that might be really uh, something that could be used as a, as a, as a, Focal point in trying to review, reduce the number. I, st I was struck by how big a number it is for such a small, relatively small number of buildings using oil. Yeah, that's the importance of the advocacy piece as well in the buildings is really advocating for those those rebate systems at higher levels of government because we as Sydney don't necessarily have the budget to be getting everyone off oil ourselves, but. Um, yeah, there's some really awesome programs out there right now, especially the income qualified program. Hoping to get my grandma to do that one. She has oil in her house in the Nanaimo, and I'm like, please get a heat pump. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I also wanted to make a comment about um, retrofits and EV charging. And I just note that. Um, the programs like the programs that are sort of talked about here in this little green area are really about um, single family for the most part. And in Sydney, we've got a lot of multifamily and it would be great to see some of these retrofitting programs. They already exist uh, at the provincial hydro Fortis level for multifamily uh, projects. But, uh, and I've already spoke to Kira about this, but in the district of Saanich, they have top ups for multifamily projects that want to uh, partake. And because we've got a lot of our housing in the multifamily area, it would be good for the town if there is money available also to look at how they can assist multifamily in terms of changing their heating or wiring to upgrade for EV vehicles in the future. That's a good comment. Something that came up last summer with the uh, heat dome, we had a lot of people that had to leave their condos. And, and part of it is the design of the condos because there's no circulation. You can't put fans in them even because the fans you don't pull the air. And so people actually stayed in hotels down the street. Uh, so I think that's something that has to be considered with the way air circulation and uh, cooling of buildings. It's going to become an issue. It'll happen again. Uh, Another, that's design probably too. I don't know, Andrew or John. Well, I see, I, you know, it's been a while since I was actually working, but I see the new buildings around town being festooned with vent, yeah. little vents all over the place. Yeah. And I believe that that's uh, to um, make up air, make up air because of the tight uh, enclosures we have now. Um, anyway, I mean, that's but it doesn't address the it doesn't the heat issue and uh, you know we a lot of this is advocating electrical heating but uh but it should be electric heating that is connected to a heat you know heat pump rather than, mm -hmm. rather than just by itself because uh, mm -hmm. it's probably the worst kind of heating uh yeah when you get when when it comes to climate comfort mm. well any any kind of heating without cooling is yeah yeah one one thing I'm not seeing here, maybe I'm, I'm missing it, is is uh, for electric electric use using the use of solar panels. 
Mm. Uh, and I think one of the detriments that, I, that sort of comes to my mind on solar panels is BC Hydro will no longer connect them back into the network from a, an individual home, mm. which uh, to me is 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 counterproductive. If you want if you want to get a, a get so uh, solar power, the use of solar power increased, it's got to be connected into the hydro grid. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure why hydro did that, but uh, I'm sure they had a good reason, but they will no longer buy it back. Mm -hmm. We need more sightsee dams. Maybe that's something the town, that's something the town can address because the, you know, the town, it, it would behoove the town, uh, this town and all other towns to, uh, um, encourage the use of solar paneling, panels for electric generation. Okay. With all the sunshine we get here, it's a given. Sunny <laughs> yeah. 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 solar. That was last year. <laughs> oh, geez. Allison, could you just give a bit of background as to why the town of Sydney hasn't adopted the step code yet, given that most other municipalities have? And most uh, other municipalities are almost at step code four. It hasn't been something that our council has asked us to look into. Um, other municipalities decided to move forward with it before it was required. And ours just hasn't, there's no no other reason. The implementation of that will do some of the legwork for you. Mm -hmm. And it when, will. it'll make it yeah. some requirements that will take it out of your hands. And the other thing as well, in like the re, in the recent months, like why it hasn't been brought forward, you know, kind of since I've started is we had a conversation kind of soon after I started and the process for that is it takes a year once you've actually started the step code process of like engagement and doing all these pieces before you yeah. can adopt it ahead of the province and so by that point you know we're now with, we're now within a year so it's faster yeah. to just let it happen yeah. than to be doing it ourselves sure. for step three but yeah. there is there are opportunities for the higher steps if we wanted to pursue um, adopting those ahead of the provincial requirements. That's right. If a municipality is going to adopt it in advance of it being required, there is yeah, a number of steps you have to go through in terms of consultation and engagement with the building community, with the community as a whole, a number of, of steps that have to be gone through. I didn't know that that and sense. with the, the volume of projects and just staff capacity and a number of other things we've had mm -hmm. to go, it hasn't been possible to right. do that stuff. But we should recommend it. So where is yeah. we won't need well to. at this it's point it's happen. happening yeah. anyway. Yeah, you won't need to recommend mm. it. What? And it's gonna take a bunch of eight months, six months. You making it a requirement out of your hands. Yeah. yeah. It'll be mm -hmm. kind of provincially mandated. And That's we right. can point the finger at the problem. Yeah. When you yeah. Are angry. <laughs> oh well, it is what it is. <laughs> but the higher steps would require a lot more. Um, so are the other municipalities around us moving to higher steps sooner or are they going to follow yes. the some are. Some are. Yeah. Well, so I was might, mentioning North Saanich. Yeah, North Saanich. Central pretty Saanich much. is being pretty aggressive Almost too. Yeah. So it might actually make sense for Sydney to go along with Central and North Saanich on the higher levels, even though they would wait for the first level to come in, possibly. It might, yeah. Although I didn't know what you were sharing about it taking so long for that implemented. I mean, by the time you've done that. Yeah, it's, it's already anywhere. Now it's yeah. a mandated program. Yeah. Is it so like on an annual basis that it goes up another step? No, no. not no. annual, but they there are like set. There's set uh, dates. There's set yeah. years. Yeah. Target years. Yeah. And twenty twenty four, twenty twenty five. Can't remember. I can't remember the years, but yeah, a municipality can decide to move faster through yep. the steps and require that new development meets higher steps than what the province is going to require. So that could be something that. Sydney goes for is to require higher steps that you said other municipalities are doing mm -hmm. in advance of those. Yeah. 2032, is that right? 2032 is net step zero. five, net yeah. zero. But yeah. the, the that's not that far off from a development point mm -hmm. of view. Yeah. Where yeah. We're yeah. Interior is supposed to be building clean energy. Right? Yeah. 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 Zero yeah. buildings. But I understand the current just meeting the, the BC building code is virtually the same as step one, just a few subtle changes. It's actually step and the, three. Step three. Yeah. And mm. it just doesn't have the testing element, like getting the energy right. code consultant in to, to review your building plan mm. and say what your energy coefficient is. Yeah. Yep. And not yep. doing the, the air tightness test probably through construction. Yep. Yeah. Current part so, nine of the building code is basically step yeah. three. It's based, they're doing it already. Yeah. Yeah. It's just well, a then, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Any other uh, comments or questions? Just, uh, I guess I, I raised this with the OCP as well. And I, I still look at the, the question of materials used uh, and the energy footprint and the waste and all of that, and <clears throat> that's a result. Uh, and I know there is innovative technology in terms of creating new construction materials that, that, that'll make a difference in, and new systems of building as well. But I don't know if it's worth mentioning in this context that uh, Sydney should encourage uh, innovative technology that reduces waste on construction sites. Hmm. Would that include so that the uh, reuse of uh, uh, deconstructed homes? I think it should. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a company in Vancouver. I think I've mentioned before. I, I mean, I'm not pushing any company or anything, but in Vancouver, Nexi is a company that's set up on mm -hmm. an island. that's set up uh, a, a factory. It's got one in Squamish, and it's expanding in the states quite dramatically. And they've been predominantly mm -hmm. doing commercial and industrial, but they they do panels, pre-constructed panels that they make to fit the building with windows and built-in uh, yeah. insulating materials and electrical systems and all of that. So it, it, it's going to, you know, that kind of thing would be very different from what we do now is we just take wood and cut it and put yeah. it together and, you know, and so forth and so forth. They're building a presence in Nanaimo right now, which is going to, um, I'll, say, I'll say, specialize more in the residential sector. Yeah. Obviously, mm -hmm. because our island is industry residential. It's going to be a huge shift, so that kind of building practice. Yeah. Mm. Especially if they're making the panels on the island, that would save the shipping cost right. of ordering from the mainland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've seen some buildings in the downtown and elsewhere in Sydney be built with the prefabricated panels yep. that go mm -hmm. up quickly, which is mm -hmm. nice for the neighborhood too, because it reduces that impact on the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. so it's different kind of things. And I will note as well, like I can definitely add that kind of language because I think it's really useful just to help orient people about like prioritization and what different things can make an impact. But that can also be brought in through, you know, investigate options to encourage builders to incorporate low emissions and resilient development features if requesting a barrier to rezoning. So I try to look at specific levers that like town staff can kind of use in a lot of these actions. So if we have like a checklist, something like this could be in a checklist, like have you incorporated any like waste reduction techniques for your building construction? Um, there's lots of different ways to kind of pull this in within the the bureaucracy. <laughs> there, there's one other thing too that I think is really noteworthy is uh, concrete is one of the major mm -hmm. producers of carbon. Yeah. And on the island, Butler Brothers and Ocean. Carbon Cure. The trio, I think, yeah. They're getting down to far reduced carbon emissions and recycling the carbon. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's worth, because Langford has actually made that a requirement of uh, concrete work. <coughs> might be worth mentioning or introducing that here too as well, but encouraging or recommending, insisting. <laughs> We've talked about that, like I brought it up with staff. The challenge is that since they're the only company that's really doing that right now, it's tricky for a local government to say you have to use this technology if only one company provides it, because then we're kind of saying you have to use this one company. Mm. No. It's tricky for us to say, mm. um, but right, it is like a really awesome technology and I'm trying to figure out a way to push the other companies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we we'll go on to natural environment. Can I start? Anybody? Sure. So that diagram we had, the Venn diagram, and they all sort of divide it. Thing that was in the center of the diagram was planting trees, mm -hmm. the urban forest on the adaptation mitigation page. And we discussed it at the OCP level. I find our tree canopy target extremely disappointingly low at 15%. So I would say continue to implement the urban forest strategy with a higher target in mind. And that, you know, will fall mostly to the town because we've discussed that also with higher density tree planting is going to be on public right away and within parks. There's not really, you know, there's limited opportunity on private development. 
That's when kind you, of where the, sorry. Mm -hmm. And when you take out a tree um, and you put in a little tree, it's gonna take 20 years for that little tree to be a canopy tree. So I think this requires really serious policy and action behind this. One of the tricky pieces with this when I was you know, looking at the section um, and talking with park staff is just the ability for our staff to bring those trees to maturity alive. Um, so it's kind of why we have, I have like the consider implementing an adopt a tree program because like there's only so much staff time available to go around and like water every single tree that we've planted and like do all of those pieces to care for them. And so, you know, if we have people who can you know, water a boulevard tree in front of their property, then that can increase the capacity of us to actually plan things. And that's something that came up when I was talking with our park staff is a real challenge when we're trying to increase our tree planting. I don't mind watering the boulevard trees, but I don't charge for the water. <laughs> yeah, that's the, thing. That's the, the, the trick. <laughs> I want to help make a change, but. <laughs> the water bill in the summer is quite substantial. I think it's a farm. That's, that's what we heard last summer, because I happen to live in a. Yeah development that is part of the urban forest designated urban forest and uh, we were advised by uh, arborists and tree stewardship people to water our douglas firs you know our 200 year old douglas firs last summer at uh, about a five thousand dollar increase in our water bill for the complex which mm -hmm. didn't really go down well with with some of the, the owners and then if the trees die then the owners are spending five thousand dollars taking mm -hmm. down dead trees to safely remove dead trees. well this is how we explained it no but uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. until the tree actually falls down or has to be removed because it's rotten you know there's there's no out expenditure but they could see the water bill right off the bat uh, and, and again maybe there's something that, that you know, uh, the town is something for the town to look into on this is the 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 because the, all of our all our water is metered through one meter to a to a complex when it's we it's known that a part of part of that water is for non domestic uses um and there's no there's no differentiation there I, I advise i i did inquire the town some time ago about putting a second water meter in and was told that the cost of that was going to be high. quite high mm -hmm. a, a cost to us to put it in to lower the water bill and our, our payback period on that was quite long. But. There is the option to get a second meter or second connection with mm -hmm. for an irrigation meter. And yeah. then you're not charged the sewer amount on that water because it's assumed the water is not going down the drain, it's going into the ground. So yeah. the, talk to the engineering of the finance department about it. That well, there it, is an option to do that. We actually, we did that. We did yeah. that at our strata. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the um, Kind of the payback was in the two to three year range. It, our, yeah. our, it was it's, it's the it's the way our our water system is distributed throughout the property. It's uh, it, it's basically impossible to separate the two the two systems. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Any other thoughts on? I've I've got one comment about uh, natural uh, or indigenous species, nat native species. Uh, I think I've mentioned this before. <clears throat> there is an issue that maybe they will not be as resilient. Mm -hmm. in, uh, mm -hmm. and, and so that the language perhaps should be about climate hardy, you know, drought tolerant or whatever phrase, however you want to phrase that, uh, which can include native species, but just to focus on native species or to differentiate the that our or let me rephrase that that our focus is on native species is probably not as valuable now as <laughs> other times. Yeah, there's definitely a need to have a, in my view, like there's value in having a balance of both. Because you have very drought tolerant trees, they don't necessarily need as much water. And so when we're when we want to have our trees for stormwater management, sucking up a lot of water, those trees aren't going to have as much stormwater management value. <laughs> so it's kind of good to have a mix of both. But yes, that's the, the trick is how do we keep those ones alive in the summer that are really valuable in the winter and vice versa. <laughs> Maybe we have to have the town separate into different areas for different trees, you know, like in the low lying areas, we put in uh, trees to suck up the water. Mm. And in the non low lying areas, we have to have drought resistant trees and have a, mm. a, a 
selection of trees that are available for each for each area. Yeah, I, and you know, my wording was sort of climate uh, adaptable species, mm -hmm. so that yeah. sort of covers the range of it. When I lived in Alberta, when I lived in Calgary, <laughs> to be specific, uh, they you know the, developed trees that could tolerate Calgary's climate. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, because in the beginning, almost nothing could tolerate Calgary's climate. So, uh, you know, the same thing could be done here. Uh, you could plant willows on all the floodplain and that would suck up the water. <laughs> also yeah. destroy your infrastructure. For yes. <laughs> okay, anything else on natural environment? We're getting close to four. Mm -hmm. uh, emergency preparedness. If I could make one comment, my wife's involved in events for emergency measures and emergency support services, and I don't see reference to PEMO here. What, sorry? To PEMO. It's in there is EMO. Is it a, is oh, is it a EMO. reference to EMO? Is that emergency measures organization or what is no, the no, emergency, no, no. emergency no. measures? Oh, okay. for the fire the department. Province. For the fire department. Right. And, and PIMO is, uh, it includes uh, search and rescue, it includes uh, radio operators, it includes emergency support services. And uh, they were not really much used during the COVID crisis as well. And uh, I, th I think there was a bit of a, a feeling that uh, the community did its emergency work without consulting them. So I, th I think it's worth mentioning because they, they do have uh, through the fire department, uh, uh, and particularly Mike Carmen, there's a lot of work with that. And I think it's a, a valuable tool that we have, and particularly with emergency planning. They were involved with uh, the gas leak on 4th that occurred about a month ago. And they have set up, they set up a center there. They have set up uh, a cooling center in central Saanich last year, but th these kinds of services should be more coordinated with the municipality as well. The conversation should be more robust, I would say. Other communities actually use them during the fires to set up their uh, reception centers and their yeah. uh, uh, how, uh, housing for displaced people. Yeah. And they were bringing them out of Sydney and taking them up to Kelowna and up to Prince George. And the fire department does use uh, emergency yeah. support services all the time. They've been very busy in the last year, but uh, I, I think it's be good for, uh, Council to be aware of it too. Sure, a reference under partnerships would probably yep. yeah. Thank you. Under the, the actions, town operations, the second box is that continue to inform and facilitate community education like me that's working with others. Yep. Partners yep. like Pimo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, food and waste. Is there any any possibility that the town is going to, would pursue uh, looking into uh, using some of the waste food products within the town itself instead of all of it being sent out to a, a central place for composting for mulching that sort of thing? Because right now it's all collected by outside agencies and shipped somewhere <laughs> overseas. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Or maybe just dumped in with the rest of the stuff. Yeah. Just kind of two options there. One would be like that would be something we'd bring up with engineering, depending on their capacity to be able to create a new program that would do that. My guess at this point would be that would be limited capacity to have a program like that run by the town. Um, option B would be, you know, supporting like a non governmental organization to do that. There's like the Victoria Compost Education Center down in Victoria that runs their own kind of compost collection service. And, you know, they're maxed out, like they have tons of people who use it. Um, so, you know, there's the potential for something like that to come to Sydney. I'm not totally sure at this time what that would look like or who would lead that, but um, that is another avenue for composting, hopefully. Mm -hmm. 
That's a good point. This seems strange to ship it off. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's crazy. The challenge is that like a lot of it gets contaminated by those who, you know, whether well-intentioned or just don't know, you know, put in things to the compost that shouldn't be in the compost and can't actually be composted. And then a lot of that stuff just has to go to the landfill, right? So but the, 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 the sorting offshoot. capacity of the town is- yeah, the, the methane the methane gas offshoot is, is considerable and-, and I think it's in good cost reduction. Looking at a potential location for processing in Sydney would challenge too, just given the limited amount of space we have, we probably have to look for a all that waste land at the airport, you know, and around the <laughs> runways. Yeah. <laughs> Make a partnership with Sandown. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're not the bird strike concerns. Yeah. <laughs> the last okay. item on this page deals with uh, uh, Residents' ability to produce food. I'm wondering if we get out of sentence there, maybe saying, including perhaps working with North Saanich and, and Central Saanich, but North Saanich and creating community gardens that citizens of the city could use. We don't have a lot of available land for community gardens in town, but but North Saanich is right next door. Maybe that's something we could look at. I can add that as a option to add in okay well we're working our way through uh chad you have to leave soon yeah i've got until 10 after and then uh, forgive me i have to excuse myself i got 4 30 yeah uh... okay um i guess we can look at the monitoring and implementation if there's any questions or comments on that I guess there were, there were a number of comments made throughout the discussion this afternoon about w where do we take this document once we've got a document that's considered to be a, you know, a final. And, and I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of work going to be required to develop a, a roadmap, an action plan, a reporting structure. I don't know how you want to describe it, but how do you, how do you actually, how do you actually move beyond words on a page to action? And how do you measure progress? And who who is responsible and accountable for reaching these objectives, and uh, and how do you engage citizens in, in in playing their role? So that's a lot to talk about, and and I'm not and it's this you know you've got two paragraphs here. I don't know whether it's worth adding some of the things that we think should be probably be included into into next steps beyond what's already there. Those are excellent questions. Mm -hmm. any, uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, that's a similar question that came up in my mind. Yeah, we can have nice reports. Now, what do we do? Mm -hmm. and, or how do we do it? There has to be a vision. Somebody has to develop a vision for the town. And that, you know, you fit all the priorities into that, that vision. So you have to have a visionary. <laughs> but you have to do it. Yeah, and that, what I mean is, it's like designing something. You have to know, you have to have a kind of a bit of a, an idea, a, idea about where you're headed, and then you start plugging things into that, uh, into that idea. You don't just, you know, uh, you, you can't do it by just trying to solve all the problems at once, you, but you try to understand what you, what you want this town to be like in 50 years from now. And, uh, you know, is it going to have, are we going to get rid of cars? Are we going to have lots of green space? Are we going to build dikes? You know, what are the top priorities and how does everything else fit into that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm the, the plan, I'm used to designing things. <laughs> the action plan sets out a lot of high priorities and the challenge that we talked earlier with you, how does, how does council make decisions on which which steps what's what you know the first two years these are the things we're going to focus on there are a couple of things that are probably you know e e easily things to win for example they could use a, a non-plastics bag mandate in the town of sydney um you know that's something that that's simple perhaps simple to do but the question was will be deciding what the most important issues are moving forward maybe maybe uh, uh, you know um, sea rise level uh, 
uh, construction bylaw is something we need to focus on, especially in areas around Tillista Park and and uh, and 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 Roberts Bay, because uh, those are going to have a profound impact on people who live there in particular. So, but the question is, you know, how do you move from these words to something else, and how do you develop an action plan? Well, I think, sorry, I'll just comment that you know maybe under inflation and monitoring, you know, we need to address reporting. Um, and I think here I had an example of other municipalities that maybe report out on a bit of a dashboard on a regular basis to their council. So the results are not only monitored, but it's bringing that lens to the forefront of discussions on a regular basis. Uh, but also this is one of many moving parts has been acknowledged throughout this. So there are always budgetary uh, constraints and discussions to be had with, with this and prioritizing. And a lot of that happens in strategic planning sessions where staff will use this for, as a tool. Uh, to make recommendations to council in terms of what can uh, be accomplished in the, in the coming budget cycle of strategic priorities. So it, I, I concur with what uh, Denny said, that there needs to be a way to you know, have this uh, circle back to be actionable. And I think there are other tools that the town uses. Uh, and again, this is a piece and part of that, but what may, what may help, uh, at least from my perspective, is addressing reporting in this document as well to ensure that this is kept in the forefront of uh, council decision making on a, on a regular basis, be it quarterly, um, yeah, whatever is best practice in that area would probably be most prudent. Sorry, Alison, I- yeah. Oh, no, that's all right. Just commenting on the, the wording in the implementation paragraph that it does say staff will be going through the projects and all the individual things in the plan and incorporating them into those department work plans and into budget proposals, taking those forward each year to council. I'm thinking what is doable each year and working with the community to move forward. But I think as a few people mentioned here too, it's gonna to be engaging the community and encouraging people to take on some ownership of this too, that they need to recognize that individual community members, there are things that they can do and advocate for, even if it's just supporting a proposed budget item and saying, yes, I'm willing to have my taxes go up because of this project here that will help Sydney's climate adaptation, help us prepare for these things. So council needs support in making those hard choices sometimes. So. Uh, from my perspective, it would seem to me to make a lot of sense again, because I think this is one of the urgent issues of our time that uh, there'd be a regular meeting, whether it's in the town hall form and information presentation to the general public and getting feedback, constant feedback. Okay, what do you think we need to do? Because this is kind of a thing that's, uh, something that's unfolding in front of us. And we can decide now that this will fix the future, but we're gonna find out as we found out last summer that we're gonna get hit by surprises, the heat dome, then the water, and then the cold. And now this weather, I mean, the last year has been the wildest year in BC for weather that uh, we've had. We're setting records in all the different seasons for our lows and wetness and all of that sort of stuff. And so I think a, a constant ongoing dialogue with the community uh, by council, but I think that staff encourages that too. Maybe, maybe council needs to create a special committee of council or a, 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 a committee on climate action plan. You know, a new structure, um, which would which would be the, the vehicle that that you know manages the process, and 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 uh, it would be transparent and open. And it would be you know. Like a community of the whole discussion, where you you would have you would have discussions, and citizens would know what kind of what's on the table. If if you have a if you create an organization, a political structure that that is in charge with leading this forward, it it does create a venue for accountability and decision making, and and in a coordinated way, for these trade offs, these these difficult decisions, as as as, as Councillor mentioned, are going to have to be ta taken. That's maybe one of the recommendations that could be put in this thing. I would just. Um flag that a lot of projects that are climate action projects are also a lot of other things. So like, you know, would an asset management plan, which is valuable for climate action, go through this before like a climate action committee, you know, like there needs to be some kind of bar for what kind of projects would be reviewed and what doesn't just so that, you know, almost any project could be considered climate action related, just, um, something to flag, keep in mind. 
That's a good point. So everything gets put under that lens, everything mm -hmm. that's just a normal part of everyday operation. Yeah, but it could get, you know, backed up if, you know, this committee has to review like 20 different projects that are completely different, but like all related to climate action. And yeah, just I'm wary of, of <laughs> the implementation of that, but I think it's really valuable to have some kind of open forum where this stuff is brought to life. It's just how it's, mm. how it's approached. Yeah. Okay. So Chad, before you go, are there any items uh, dispositioned by council that you would like to report? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, just following up from your previous APC meeting where there were like three separate uh, uh, matters discussed, all, all three of those had advanced. And if I recall, the, um, the, uh, the only one with a variance was uh, the 9617 7th uh, Street. Yes, sir. Uh, and so that item uh, would go up for uh, uh, public consultation and come back to uh, to council with feedback from that. The other uh, two projects uh, were moved uh, forward in keeping with the recommendations from APC. So that was um, the 9989 and 99915th nine, Street, as well as the uh, Harbor Road project. So those all came back before uh, council. And I may anticipate that there was at least one item on the agenda for this evening that uh, Staff recommend the referral to uh, mm. APC on, on, on that item. So that may come before uh, APC in the near future. Okay. Any questions for Councillor and Tool? My apologies. I'll watch the end of the video. Oh, like sure. so. Okay. <laughs> are there any other comments or are we ready to uh, call it a day? Yeah. Okay. Motion to adjourn. What about a record of decision? Do you want to do that here or do you want to, or do you want to do that? I think you have three note takers and Clarence, you suggested you might maybe elaborate or so if, you, if, you, if you're willing to do that, that might work. I'll, so I'll put mine and I'll send them to Allison and Ruth. Ruth and then you can give feedback on things I've missed and you can and then once we do that, say by the end of the week, and then circulate them among the group. And if, if you guys have any comments, then sure. Okay. Does that sound fair? Yeah. Well done, Kara. So thank you. Yeah. That way, if you have anything that you think we've missed, we're we're this is a, a team. So then these minutes won't be going to the April twenty fifth council meeting. They would go to the next council meeting for consideration. Just... Yeah, that would probably be the case, wouldn't it? the deadline is technically today first thing tomorrow morning for the monday april 25th council oh, I I there was a lot of discussion yeah and we so would want to see the we'll go to the next one they went out to council anyway so so I, they so won't we, delay anything very much if, we, if it goes to a later council no because no. no. we're still on target for your consultation yeah right? i have another public engagement event um this week and then the common period is going to be open until Mid May, anyway, is what I'm thinking. Yeah, so I think they're good. So, yeah. Okay. And we have what seven note takers here, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, motion to adjourn then. I'll move the that we adjourn. Andrew, second. In favor? All in favor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. It was really good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 thanks, Thank Derek. Overall, I think that. You, but apparently we couldn't. <laughs> Overall, I thought the document looked really yeah, good. There's a lot of work that's been Yeah. 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 Had to make it as digestible as yeah. possible, which yeah. can be really, really hard. But yeah.